Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I am honored and blessed to have my next guest on the show, Mr. Hillman Sori, co-founder of Closed Loop and co-founder of Coach CRM. How are you doing today? I'm great, David. I'm happy to be here. I've been uh, actively following you for many, many moons. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Yeah, it's been many moons. <laughs> <It has. laughs> hey, that's yep. good. You know, the, the whole, uh, what is it? Persistence is key, right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, we've been, we've been trying to figure out sales development and <laughs> all the new trends and how to do the job for a long time and it keeps changing right and and it, it keeps getting harder and um, more more in in depth to try to get the best practices out there and and so we're we're hopefully scratching the surface after 5 years well you know i think the important thing is that it it, evo it evolves right yeah. i mean that's part of the challenge is it's a moving target it would be great if these cats would stay in one spot and you, you yeah. wouldn't have to herd them, but they keep jumping and leaping and moving. And, you know, yeah, it's it's a it's a constant thing. And your contribution to uh, the field has been immense. And so uh, I'm appreciative of it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it keeps me like I keep, it keeps me going every day to try to learn about this, because at the end of the day, it's pipeline and revenue. You know, right. and all the different like that sounds so simple, but it's all the different um, pieces of the puzzle that you have to put together from the people to the processes to the technology. And there, there's just there's so much involved. And, and it's like you said, it's always changing. So it's just it's an interesting topic. And so and here then, we are. <laughs> and then there's that other piece that you can't control, which is the marketplace, right? And what your customer is oh doing God. and how they're evolving and how they want to be interacted with and what their journey looks like and mm. you know what channels they've decided to go deaf on. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh, it's constantly changing. Yeah. Um, and and you know, now we're we're especially in the tech industry, like we're we're in the first two um, get hit by, you know, macroeconomic shocks. Uh, it's, right. so it's almost like, you know, crossing the chasm, like we're the early adopter oh, yeah. of whatever bad news. That's exactly <laughs> right. We embrace it wholeheartedly, don't we? <laughs> and it's just like, just as fast as it goes up, it goes down. So, um, you know, just responding to all those and, and um, you know, uh, learning the new approaches that we need to take to be able to 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 continue to build pipeline and revenue like it's never ending man it is it is yeah. that's what we love right drinking yeah. from that well every day <laughs> well dude okay so so you know you you've had such an interesting background and in working especially with Corey bray who like is, <laughs> is another legend in our industry um and and you guys have been great partners for a long time how yeah. did you tell me about how you got involved in closed loop and then now you know building coach CRM yeah so so closed loop really um going back to I guess just a little a little of my background right I had been in sales for a number of years both uh, professional services and management consulting sales I was uh, media sales working with a large uh, digital media entity and then tech sales and had you know, the increasingly more responsibility started off kind of like an inside sales moved up to it wasn't called SDRs back then. You know, it was it was yeah. telemarketers back then. Oh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I got I go that far back. We're not gonna talk about that. But, um, <laughs> you know, mo moved into account executive into strategic, you know, went down the whole path and then eventually had my own team. And I got to a point where I I could not move the needle anymore with my team. I was great as an IC, you know what I mean? And then yeah. with a team, I got to a point where despite the tips and tricks that I was immersing myself in, read every book under the sun, tried different methodologies, you know, to a certain extent. And I realized it was a me thing that I just could not get it done. And then of course my employer realized it was a me thing too. <laughs> and so I was, I was shown the door. Um, and I vowed to yeah. never let that happen again. I was that kid who, you know, for Christmas, I would get a remote control car and let's say that's seven o'clock in the morning when I've gone under the tree and I've opened the opened the present, you know, by 11 o'clock, that thing was taken apart and I'm trying to figure out how it works. So oh, wow. I, I kept that. Yeah, my parents loved that. But um, kind of and, and sometimes I was even, even able to get it back together. But the yeah. idea was I, I did figure out how it Thanks worked. a lot, Hillman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> they stopped, still kept giving me gifts, though. You know, the, yeah. the gifts kept, got, got a little more intricate as, as time went on. But, you know, the, the gift of that to me is that I've always been someone who likes to take things apart, figure out, like, what is the core essence? You know, what's necessary to put back together and how you make it faster, stronger, better, lighter, you know, cheaper, whatever it might be. And mm. so after leaving that gig, what I did is um, I decided, hey, I'm going to go work for one of the top sales training organizations in the world. And that's what I did in uh, the Bay Area for for one of the top franchises and did that for nearly 10 years, learning the ins and outs of training, working with literally thousands of companies and tens of thousands of sales reps and really getting immersed into what the challenges were that were facing folks in Silicon Valley, because that's where I was, and how to go best about addressing those and how to build an organization that can do that effectively. And it got to a point where I realized, you know, what we were doing in that organization was no longer effective. We were kind of riding the fumes of old methodologies that had been created in the 70s and 80s. And while human beings didn't change, to your point, as the way you started the show, a lot of these things with respect to process and technology and rules of engagement and channels and all of these other things, the buyer themselves, had intent data, things like this had changed. So I decided I was going to just take some time off. In the interim, Corey had become a client of mine. He was a head of sales for a legal tech company in the Bay Area, was looking for a coach. And I tried everything I could not to work with him as an individual because I wasn't working with individuals at this point. I was like, oh, I'm big time. I got these big companies to work with. What do I want to do with this kid from Texas, right? <laughs> and um, being wow. poor as he is, you know, he's, he's a force of nature. He doesn't take no very easily. So I made him meet with me uh, after five o'clock on Mondays every week. <laughs> <laughs> and we forged this. You can bond. make it go away. <laughs> I couldn't make. I really tried. I would be, and I would, you know, I got to a point. Here's the interesting piece. We got to a point where we had tried so much with this company that I actually had to fire him. It wasn't a Corey thing. It was, it was a product thing. And shortly thereafter, he realized, well, if Hillman's firing me, then I'm probably on the wrong horse. <laughs> so <laughs> he left that. And you know, to make a long story a little less less long, we we forged a bond in understanding that there's very little overlap in our our Venn diagram with our skill sets, and we both have a lot of passion, and you know, we think a lot of uh, expertise around the areas that we have capabilities. And so we looked at the world of sales enablement, the world of sales training, the world of professional development and management consulting in the same way, and decided that we could come at this from a more powerful, more modern perspective. And so Closed Loop was born and, you know, we're about four and a half years into it now. We won a Selling Power Top Training Firm Award this year, which is great. And uh, we've oh, helped wow. a lot of people grow. So that's that's where we are today. Oh, man. C congrats. That's awesome, thank you. dude. Yeah. Thank so, you. so and, you know, I won't I won't mention I just looked at your LinkedIn. I won't mention the training <laughs> provider that you were with for a long time, <laughs> um, but people can look it up. Um, yeah, and, I, I and, try not to name names. Yeah, yeah, no, you're totally good <laughs> with our, our mass audience of listeners. You know, I think you'll be good. Um, so, so when you're you're working with these companies. Yeah. But what discoveries have you made? of working with sales teams like what how how has you know their needs changed and yeah. and you know what how do you enable sales teams you know with and what you developed at closed loop you know you you, you talked a lot about um the nature of sales development specifically and and how that's a moving target and how you know the technology the people the mm -hmm. adaptation of management the understanding of the marketplace all of these things have changed it has the same impact on training and professional development. Um, and that's that's what's really interesting is that we take that and then we compound it with the fact that, hey, you've got a team that could be hybrid, could be remote. They might be in the office. If they're in the office, they're staring at screens all day long. They're not, you know, they're they're not in some sort of a call center where you just bought by and have these conversations. There's automation where the velocity of business is moving at such a significant clip that it's well beyond what it was 10 years ago. And, you know, obviously 20 years before that, the impact is significant because particularly in the SDR world, your top of funnel demand gen is critical for proving out all of these hypotheses that, that venture capital has invested in, right? Most SDRs are in a VC type organization that's got a uh, high, high, high hockey stick expectation of revenue growth and scale to get to the next next gate, uh, next tranche of, of revenue and, and fund development. So all of those implications are sitting there and they're wholly, develop, they're wholly dependent upon being able to hire and train and execute and promote 
folks into the organization. So what's changed? Well, a number of things. Training delivery can happen in workflow. Um, coaching can happen in myriad ways, whereas coaching used to be just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, the retention of those assets and data can happen in different ways. The assessment of individuals can happen in different wage, ways. So all of this is critically important to the function of performance management because that's your ultimate goal. And what we found in closed loop, you know, this is kind of segueing into coach CRM. What mm. we found in closed loop was that the greatest fulcrum, you know, the lowest hanging opportunity with the biggest value reward was getting folks in that frontline manager role competent around coaching. Right. If you've got competent coaches, a number of things happen. One, you're you're more liable to hit your goals. You're more liable to keep that manager. You're more liable to keep your team. You're more liable to be able to promote folks from within. And you know it goes on and on and on the list here. And this is this is a sunken cost because the individuals are in your organization anyway. You don't have to go externally to bring in somebody to do this and then have them go away with their knowledge base. You can build this internally. And what we found was that when we were able to achieve this inside of our client organizations, they developed consistent and significant competitive advantage. And that competitive advantage is something that they have retained ongoing. And that's really where we began to see an opportunity for a software tool, a platform like Coach CRM to exist in the marketplace. Got it, okay. So this is so interesting because especially now in a re remote environment, the, yeah. the kind of the pathway to sales, at least in the software industry is, you're an SDR and then you're kind of up or out to some extent. And yeah. then you become an AE if you're if you're doing well and you get promoted. But um, the, and then they come in and they're working from home and and they don't even have the sort of the bullpen, you know, uh, like office uh, where you could turn to the guy next to you or a gal next to you and ask a question and, you know, get some help. So the, it's very isolated. And then um, the coaching might be just a little bit of training, you know, coming in and then a one on one, you know, maybe like once a week and some Slack messages. So I, it, it seems like it's very isolated these days. With, Absolutely. With, mm -hmm. Huge problem. You know, it, it's we, we named the, the company Coach CRM for a reason. Coach mm -hmm. Coach CRM stands for Coaching Results Management. Sometimes you know, people believe it's a misnomer that it's actually a CRM, but it's really Coaching Results Management. And the way we look at it, though, is if mm -hmm. you were to pattern match against a typical CRM, you know, a typical CRM is looking at revenue and retention as the external goal of, of performance, right? Well, if you look internally, and you say, what is your internal currency from the standpoint of human capital? And what are you trying to do with relation to that team? What you're really focusing on is performance and professional development. And it's the same thing. You have opportunities there, just like you have sales opportunities. You have leads in the form of challenges that if you can convert those challenges into resolution, you're actually significantly impacting that person's ability to perform, which should have a reciprocal impact on the business, right? So how do you take these things? And David, you nailed it. There are, there are myriad conversations taking place in everything from Slack to your CRM to the, the notes that you're dribbling in, you know, in, in your, your call recording software to, um, you know, email, wherever it might be. They're all disparate. They're all over the place. And the problem with that is it doesn't create any consistency. It doesn't afford any opportunity for activity progression and understanding that you're actually moving the needle on something. You can't share it as tribal knowledge. It's the bane of everyone's existence. You know, we, we hopped on a little earlier and we're, we're bemoaning what Slack looks like and, you know, where the messages are. And Slack is looking more and more like email, even though that's what they were supposedly eschewing early on, right? right. So gr great tool for some things, right? Not for coaching performance. Right. So how do you create a tool that is not a burden to front level management or to to leadership, but instead is a tool that managers can sink into as a platform that's going to help them to leverage a one to many way of moving performance, both individually and for the entire team? That's where we saw the opportunity. And, you know, so the, the alignment here between closed loop and coach CRM was that we did have this this group of really fantastic, really top level fast growing clients who had these problems at closed loop. Mm. And you know, one of the best testing beds for software is a spreadsheet. 
And if you know Corey Bray well, he never met a spreadsheet he didn't like. So he took our coaching training <laughs> methodology, which we wrote a book on, The Five Secrets of a Sales Coach, dropped mm. it into a spreadsheet, which we used in our training engagements. And in those spreadsheets, we would work with management teams around, here's how you effectively coach in 20 minutes or less. Here's how you go about holding folks accountable. Here's how you go about ensuring that you've got outcomes. Here's how you go about ensuring that you understand consequences. And here it is in a spreadsheet. And we'd roll that out to folks and they would continue to use that spreadsheet. And eventually we got to the point, you know, after being in business a certain number of years, you get to a point where your, your clients are just still your clients and they hit you back and they're like, you know, the spreadsheet is getting broken. <laughs> you know, I've got so many tabs. I've got so many employees. I've got people who've come and gone. I've got people who've been promoted. I need a better way of managing. Can't you do something better than a spreadsheet? And you know, what better pull or push to get someone to create software than, than from uh, a nice uh, corpus of your client base telling you that they need something more. And that's really where Coach CRM was born. That's interesting. So for the product developers out there, if you hear my spreadsheet is broken, you know, yes. that's, that should, <laughs> that you should know, make you think. Okay. It's part, it's part of our mantra, David, you know, even, yeah. even from a management perspective, when we go in and do uh, something called a sales, sales effectiveness assessment, where we're looking at strategy systems, staff and skills in an organization, when we look at systems, what we often say is like, why do you have such poor utilization here? Well, you've got poor utilization because you've over-engineered the tool. Like break the spreadsheet first, do it in analog to the extent that you can, understand your process, get a process that works, and then exceed the utility of a spreadsheet before you go investing in sales tech. I know that's going to make some people very angry that are in that um, that uh, uh, diagram that you create with 7,000 sales and marketing automation tools. Oh. But um, <laughs> only 500. Let's talk about the market map. <laughs> yeah, the market map. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. But well, really, it's that's... funny. It just makes me think because we're we're a small company, and and um, the the renewal came up for Salesforce.com, and so the finance guy here at Tenbound was like, you know, you could run this in a spreadsheet, and you could save, you know, a lot of money. And I go, that's it. Oh man, it's hard to go back when you've had. It is the, hard to go back. The, it's the a great system, and it's like let's go back to a spreadsheet. But when you get that big bill, you're like. <laughs> Maybe, I'll consider but, it, right? <laughs> yeah. But that would break pretty quick. And yeah. and by the way, as you you know, you're rattling off all this stuff, Hillman. You you guys have written like six books about Eight. this. Yeah. Eight. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, didn't I guess I need homework. to ship you too. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, and everybody that you, you you have to read these books. I mean, they're very practical. And you can you can tell that because of your work hands-on over the years with real sales and marketing, you know, challenges that it's not a bunch of fluff and, yeah. and theory. It's like this, here's exactly what we've seen um, be successful in coaching, for example. Yeah, it's yeah. our big mantra there is, is we look at it like open open sourcing, you know, we're like, yeah. let's just open the kimono and not everybody can afford to work with closed loop. Um, and, and not everybody is going to be a software customer, but everybody should understand what these practices are, where they came from and, and how they've been proven out and then make a determination around whether or not this is something that could be impactful in their organization. So we have literally, there is, we publish what we have proven, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's our mantra. And, and we publish it in a no fluff way so that someone can take a book, get through it. In an airplane trip, that's kind of our 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 barometer, right? Can, can you can you fly across country, learn something, and oh. go apply it when you land, right? <laughs> nice. Um, okay. And, and be able to take those things and and move the needle. That's the goal. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think people, you know, they they're hesitant to like buy business books in general because they're just like, uh, you know, it's an it's another high high level, you know, fluff that that I can't actually use. Three pages but, of value, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it could be condensed down to like a, a blog post, you know, but yeah. but with your 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 guys is is it's different. Um, so it's highly recommended that we check that out. Another thing that made me think, you know, about what you're doing is, um, you know, in the really old days, the and you said telemarketer, so I know that oh, yeah. you, you're with. I'm me, really right? old. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so sales coaching was like. Um, if you've seen Tommy Boy or or The Office, you know, they're, yeah. they're like um, the the sales manager and the sales rep would drive out to the 
location, do the sales call and then drive back to the office. And the coaching, you know, took place throughout that, that process That's as great. they were getting donuts and coffee and stuff yeah. and, and driving together. And it's, it, it's, I think it's, it's hard to replicate that in our digital environment. Just as you said, there's so many inputs and pieces of information. It's like, I, it feels like people get kind of overwhelmed. You know what's interesting about that? I, I've thought long and hard about this um, because we work with so many different types of teams. And, you know, typically the SDR teams are a little younger in age and might be closer to, you know, Gen Z and you've got Gen Alpha coming along now. You know, my, my kid is actually out there in her first job doing some stuff, which is terrifying, terrifying and gratifying at the same time <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons. But, yeah. um, wow. you know, here's the thing that I've come to realize. We may think of that, and I'm going to co-opt you here, David. I'm going to pull you into my age group, uh, make some assumptions, right? Fair we enough. may think of it that way. Mm -hmm. We may be thinking it's difficult because you don't have that high touch. You don't have that managed by walking around where everybody gets to hear a conversation and you stop by and you go, you know, that was really good, but you got to do this thing over here. Or you hear Jennifer across the way say something that's really golden. You know, th there's, there's certainly value in that. And I'll tell you that there's a generation that has never had that kind of exposure and has lived with a phone in their hand, has lived with a screen in front of them and has, you know, navigated to the best of their own ability um, into a place inside of your office. Well, maybe not literally inside of your office, but at least inside of your company without ever having that. And so mm. the sooner we're able mm. to kind of divorce ourselves of the idea of what was was better and realize that what is is what is, then we get to a point and the onus is on us in management. You know, one of the first things that I said in starting the conversation was it was a me problem, the managing piece, right? So mm -hmm. if we take ownership of that and realize, wow, we do have a decentralized workforce. We do have folks that are either hybrid or remote, or maybe they're in the office, whatever the situation might be. We do have technology we can leverage. I need to learn what the pieces were that were most critical because it wasn't the donuts and it wasn't necessarily the car ride. It was the storytelling that maybe took place in the car on the way to Dunder Mifflin's next meeting, right? It was yeah. the it was the the <laughs> ability of someone to witness what you're doing, right? Which is still not the best way to train somebody, like watch what I do and then go do it kind of a thing. But there's a certain level of emulation. And then really being able to break that rubric into its, its parts that allow you to be effective in getting someone where they need to be in an organization. And I'll tell you this, if you want to go thin and agile on a tech stack for any sales organization, I say go heavy on a on a, um, a learning management system where you can actually invest in owning your own training in a way that's got spaced repetition, reinforcement, certification. And I don't mean like, you know, the, the talking head videos of like, you know, the old sexual harassment videos and compliance. Oh, God. I, I mean, yeah, you remember yeah, those, right? I They're still exactly. out there on YouTube, by the way. <laughs> I, I mean, good training that's really leveraging stuff and not just full on yeah. gamification where it's all fluff, right? You got to work with somebody who understands how to train people. Then mm -hmm. you go heavy on coaching, on a coaching platform that is built for managers to be able to coach one to many, be able to track challenges, understand how to move those challenges through resolution, in, engages enablement and leadership in the process of imbuing the manager with the guidance and with the training that they need to be impactful as managers, because that's a critical piece too, right? Because that 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 rolls downhill to, to the actual IC and the individual rep, and then holds the rep accountable to activity that's going to move the needle and tracks their performance, and a CRM, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're actually tracking deal performance, which is your output of the production. Those three things, when done well and in concert and thoughtfully considered, can significantly move the needle on performance for, for a team. Well, it's interesting because one one thing you mentioned leveraging the manager and 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 uh, how underutilized that that resource is and yeah. that that I I see out there, in that they they don't have a lot of um, guidance and structure on how to coach yeah and and how to be effective in that way and it just makes me think um, this is totally off topic but um, Chick Fil A um, it pays like a hundred grand for a great manager at one yeah. of their stores or more, uh, because I think that they realize that the leverage point at those stores is an amazing general manager. And yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, McDonald's, any, I mean, you yeah. think of, I, I spent some time in retail and like the retail mm -hmm. management track was a fairly highly compensated track where they understood and there was manager development because they understood mm -hmm. that was critical 
to the proliferation of their stores, to quality assurance, to the retention and attraction of employees. I mean, that's the whole thing. It's so interesting you know, that, that we cut our nose off to spite our face in sales management often by either promoting salespeople to, you know, their Peter principle, to their, their, their position of least um, knowledge and competence, right? Mm -hmm. So that does two things. It takes an awesome salesperson off the sales floor because Hillman was great at sales and now we're going to make a manager because we want to keep him and we want more people mm -hmm. like him, but we're not going to train him how to manage. And we're also going to get rid of his quota number that he was hitting really well and put him in an office somewhere where he's tracking down some other people. I mean, it's just so counterintuitive. And very seldom do you find organizations that have really clear rigor around not just the coaching piece, but the whole management tra trajectory, which could be account, um, uh, I'm sorry, accountability, could be leadership, could be understanding how to articulate vision down to your team from a high level strategy, understanding how to hire people, how to retain people, how to coach people, you know, all of these types of things that are critical in, in a management construct. I mean, there's a reason why Fortune 500 companies are so successful when we spend so much, so many dollars and so many resources in ensuring that frontline managers all the way up to high level executive leadership are consistently trained inside the organization on whatever that organizational philosophy is. Yeah. A lot I of mean, times you don't. So true. Yeah. And, and a lot of times one of the challenges is, you know, we're moving at the speed of light. If we're talking about technology companies, if we're talking about venture funded technology companies, there's not a lot of time to be um, thoughtfully considered in how you go about doing this. Um, and that's where, you know, this sounds a little self-serving, but that's where you got to leverage an expert who's been doing this across multiple industries and has a lot of experience at this and can help you build what you need. Um, and pattern match towards where there's been some previous success rather than you out there trying to reinvent the wheel and losing great people in the process or missing targets. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. And and closed loop is still thriving, right? It's still going. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. So the, you got your whole advisory team on that end and then getting this intel into the coach CRM to continue That's right. to build the product. Yeah. One one informs the other for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. a per, it's it's great. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, a a great platoon, you can have a great platoon, but if you don't have a, a great sergeant, you know, they, they could be going <laughs> completely, you can imagine if a platoon didn't have a great sergeant, you know. Do you, do you want to know yeah. what's interesting about that analogy, David? So mm -hmm. back to that story I shared where it was a yeah. me problem and they let me go because of it. Do you know what the parting words were of my CEO? He said, Hillman, mm -hmm. this, he actually said this with tears. He's like, I hate to let you go, mm -hmm. but I need a sergeant, not another general. That was his feedback. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. like, first I was like, what the? the heck does that mean right yeah. <laughs> and then i pieced it together and it was absolutely that I, I was not a leader of people at the time i hadn't developed those chops yet i was instead mm -hmm. very high level strategic and i could do some things on my own um yeah. but i i was not making my team better yeah yeah it's funny in 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 the meltdown in in 2008 2009 our vp of sales came in at the company I was working with and, and um, he g gave this kind of state of the union speech. And, and he said, we really need to focus on what we can control and mm -hmm. let, you know, let the rest go. And, and we were just like, dude, whatever, you know, <laughs> like, but, but then, but then fast forward like 20 years. And, and I realized that's a quote from, um, you know, Marcus Aurelius, a oh, yeah. great, uh, stoic philosopher. Absolutely. And it's one of the most useful things that you can think of, you know, um, but at the time I, you know, the student has to be ready for the learning. You know. Isn't that the truth? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish I was ready when I was 22, but you know, I, I scraped some knees along the way. <laughs> I know you kind of, you gotta, you gotta learn at your own pace. It's so frustrating because by the time you, by the time you gain a little bit of wisdom, it's like, okay, now retire, you know, and go, right. go out to pasture. Put okay. you out to pasture. That's right. <laughs> You're done. You're done. So, no, it's okay. interesting though. Just, just, um, you know, I think like, I always think, um, if you had a magic wand and say you got some venture funding and you needed to put together a sales team yeah. these days, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is just hire like, you know, five AEs and an SDR, you know, to support them. And right. they're off to the races, but it would be better if you if say you had four headcount that you hired, you know, a rev ops person, a coach you know, an enablement person and, yep. and then an SDR and an AE. And it's like, 
battle you know, first, scale. Yeah, you know what I mean? And then build oh, yeah. the foundation and then add the individuals back into that. Um, you know, what's it, very interesting yeah. about that, we work with a lot of uh, uh, private equity firms as well. And yeah. what we're hearing from them is they they are taking that piece. They they understand the importance of it, and they also understand. And obviously, they they have a different growth curve than would a venture backed company. But um, mm. they understand that piece, and they're building it in. and And that's a place where we're supporting them with frameworks and with rubrics and with metrics and with assessment tools and things like that that they can use. But they they find it so critically important and difficult to impress upon um, you know a CEO of a software company that's growing. That yeah, you know, put the money in RevOps and a coach <laughs> instead yeah. of in these three heavy hitting, you know, AEs and an SDR. Uh, difficult argument to be made, but you know, if again, let's go back to the spreadsheet. Put some of this stuff into a spreadsheet, see how things scale, and don't do the lemming mentality of just following what companies did ten years ago because that was the path, um, and you might be surprised. Yeah, and and it's it's kind of like. Um... You know, if there's like a bell curve of just all the different aspects that come into great salespeople, you know, the, the, you're you're kind of the tail end is the A player who yeah. they're going to be an A player no matter if you've got sure. like, you know, two sticks and a, <laughs> a rock or something, they'll <laughs> they'll make it happen. But then the meaty part is like, you know, your your average your B and C players, it's like, that's the meaty part of the population, you know? Right. So if you, if you don't have the infrastructure set up to help them, then I think you're just setting kind of, you're setting yourself up for disappointment because they're just not going to have the, the resources to be able to do the job. Well, I think that's true. And yeah. I think it's, it's not sexy, you know, apologies to to the rev ops, sales ops, and enablement people out there. I'm, I'm sure you're sexy yeah. in your mirror at home, but um, <laughs> it, it, it's not sexy on paper. <laughs> Whereas you could say, if I get, you know, if I've got this TAM that I need to address, then I've got these number of reps who I'm going to partition based upon this attribution of potential revenue. And that looks real, right? It's It takes a little more uh, horsepower, you know, yeah. in, in your mind to be able to figure out what the contribution to revenue is of having folks who are in these operations roles and support roles that actually provide and grease the skids for those sellers. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if you if you go on to YouTube, I call it like YouTube University because it's pretty much where I learn stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you go on to YouTube and, and you, you find a, like a very successful, you know, uh, CEO who, who uh, had a huge IPO, now he's a VC. And he's giving a talk at a conference about how to set up your go-to-market engine. You know, yeah. if you just got some funding, the, you know, they're going to say, um, they're going to kind of map, okay, here's how many SDRs you should get. And here's how many AEs and, you know, here's what you should expect and stuff like that. So there, there, there's just sort of a knowledge gap of what it actually takes to run a really successful go-to-market team. Um, which you're, you know, you're addressing with, with coach based on what you've seen at, at close loop. Absolutely. You and know? I mean, you know, some of the, some of the early results that we've had with coach CRM early clients, you know, there, there are three facets to the software itself. There's the playbook, the clipboard, um, and then there's a piece that's the university and the clipboard is really where all the action and activity takes place and where we hold folks accountable. And just through the use of the clipboard, we had one client resolve um, every PIP every performance improvement plan inside of a month. Um, and you can just think wow. of what kind of, you know, continued impact that that has. And it's just about keeping everything in one place, having absolute consistency, having absolute clarity, ensuring that folks are focused on what should be resolved and creating a space where a manager can go to as a repository to check out that activity. Another team used the playbook really effectively in um, an organization that had a team of account execs that were pretty junior, also had a team of frontline managers who had been promoted from being account executives. So they had not been in this role before. Well, sales enablement came in, leveraged the playbook in a way that would allow for leadership and sales enablement to inform the managers 
around, okay, here's what we're doing strategically. Here's how this looks tactically in execution. And here are ways we can help you to support your team, either with resources or with specific, specific concepts around how you go about training the team to do certain things or holding them accountable to the metrics that matter. A lot of times that's the challenge for front level, frontline management. I know it was the challenge I was experiencing when I was struggling years ago in managing a team. I didn't know what lever to pull. There's so many things in sales. There's so many variables. It could be how you started the conversation. It's your discovery. It's your demo. It's how you presented the demo. It's who you talked to. It's your follow-up. It's your, I mean, it could be a million things. And really good managers know the throughput. They're like, oh, no, no, no. You just don't ask good pain questions. You know, you can skip all this other stuff, but you'll get people engaged in your process if you help them uncover that they've got a problem that needs resolution, right? So when you're able to do that, and it does take some chops and some gray hair or some no hair to get there, pull in those resources from your org to be able to support you in the form of this playbook. And the, the resources could be a peer. It could be someone who's, you know, sitting right, figuratively sitting right next to you um, that's been at this a little longer than you. So that's, that's where a playbook actually helped this organization to get folks, you know, for the first time hitting their number across the org. Um, and that was all led by the enablement team. And then there's, there's another place where folks dropped into the university, some opportunities to create real clear plays, real clear training for management that was point solution, as opposed to boiling the ocean and saying, here's your management training. Instead, you know, here's, here's how we're going to train you on how to roll out this specific product. And instead of us just pulling everybody offline for a town hall and product marketing going, here's the new thing and it's swifter, faster, stronger, lighter, better, stronger, and then go back and sell it. They said, no, here, here's the real impact you know, to our ICP. And here's how we can train and reinforce this to the team, roll this out. And here are the challenges that we're going to be looking for. So we've had, you know, we're early days with this, but we've had some real significant activity and impact already evidenced from folks using coach CRM. So we're, um, we're hopeful that, that we're on to something that's a unique tool, the first tool expressly for management and leadership, um, as, as opposed to being a yoke around their neck that they need to go chase down and sit and listen to call recordings all weekend long. You know? right. <laughs> Those types of things. Yeah. That's amazing. So so a couple of questions there. So the, the first example that you gave, resolving the PIP. When yeah. I think of resolving a PIP, it's like the guy got fired. So. I know, right? Because so, that's what usually happens. A pitch usually is just like a foregone conclusion. Yeah. Okay. So, so, and what's interesting because when somebody, if you're a sales manager and somebody's put on a pip, it's, it's yeah. kind of like you're being shown the door to some extent because yeah. you're not making it. But, but what you're saying is they, they plugged in the data and used coach CRM and, and was able to get the person resolved on the pip in a positive way. Absolutely. And it was okay. our goal. We said, look, yeah. you got these folks sitting on a PIP. Um, they're still in the organization. Let's not just forget about them completely. What is it? What is the challenge? What yeah. are they not realizing? Because here's what we have to realize. Again, it's often a manager problem, mm -hmm. right? It's often I'm not holding someone accountable or I haven't trained someone and imbued them with the skills or I haven't shown them the things that they need to be doing or I'm not, whatever it might be. So we said, how do we create some alignment here? through software. So this isn't you spending an hour and a half with Hillman because he's failing every week because that's that's a recipe for disaster. You don't necessarily want to do that. But what yeah. can we do to potentially impact this individual's success? And we helped them, you know, through through our training. We helped them narrow focus on what the challenges were and helped them move those challenges toward resolution. And, you know, what's better than keeping an employee? I mean, think about what that does to team morale. Think about what that does for that employee. Think about what that does for that manager. Our goal is to make managers heroes. You know, there's so much managers get, get, get uh, the, the, the raw end of the stick. Is that a thing? I don't know. They get something bad. Yeah, the, uh, I think very, it's the short end. Is yeah. it the short end? Yeah. <laughs> Well, what's the raw end? There's a raw end of something that's the raw end everything. of the deal or something. I don't that's know. Something it. like that. That's yeah. it. They, they get a raw deal <laughs> and the get... short end of the stick. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, it's so true. It's got to be one of the hardest jobs. I mean, it's totally. And here's the thing yeah. the things that they do that are highly impactful, the things that really good managers do, they're inside of a black box. You don't get yeah. to hear the conversation David had with Hillman to help him to, to get his head back in the game or to coach him on how better to do something. You know, you don't get that. Well, in, in coach CRM, those conversations are tracked. And so two things happen. One, it absolutely impacts the IC. It absolutely impacts the rep. But here's the other little secret. It rolls up to leadership where that manager now gets spotlighted for being someone who is actively coaching, 
who's coaching the right things, who is moving things toward resolution, just like your, your, your opportunity CRM, just like your sales CRM does, it moves things through, you know, a Kanban level of resolution. And wow, now suddenly a manager is getting accolades and, and leadership gets to see with transparency how their strategic vision is being tactically executed throughout the organization. Really powerful. That's amazing. And and the 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 other one I wanted to highlight is um, you said in the second example that sales enablement came in. You know, and yeah. and um, it, it sometimes you get kind of eye rolls from the sales team when sales enablement comes in. What? It's like, what are you talking okay. about? What? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I this is a, I I haven't been in the corporate world for a long time, but I just remember it, it's kind of like. Um, Jack Nicholson, you know, when he was being interrogated in the movie and he's like, you can't handle the truth, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There like, you um, go. You know, that that there's sort of that separation of I'm a sales rep and now I've got these people coming in and telling me, you know, how I should um, perform and stuff like that. So yeah. so when and that's not at every company, but but, um, you know, how do you get over that that, uh, you know, sort of uh, standoff between Okay, here we go with sales enablement again. <laughs> I'll tell you, the, the easiest way to do that is to be impactful. I, I, okay. I know that sounds that 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 sounds dumb, um, but truly, when we work with sales enablement, we we tell these folks that you should be the internal consultant. Your job yeah. is to be able to understand where the gaps are, to be constantly assessing and evaluating, and to be leveraging the relationships that you have, because seldom do they have direct reports or direct authority over the sales team. They need to leverage relationships to ensure that they're moving the needle on the things that have been identified as performance challenges or critical for the business. And I'll tell you this, yeah. I have never met a salesperson who turns their back on someone who has helped them to be successful. So the goal there, a lot of times, you know, sales enablement becomes special projects coordinator. It's like, oh, we need content on so-and-so. And so sales enablement goes running around, Googling some things, comes back with something, presents it in a PowerPoint, pulls the whole team off and nobody ever uses it, right? Well, yeah. that was a misalignment of what sales enablement should be doing. You need sales enablement to be at the table in those critical discussions around where we need the team to go. And if it is a piece of content, if it is a piece of training, if it is, a, if it is some level of coaching, whatever it might be, sales enablement needs to be at the forefront of ensuring that the IC is getting benefit, tangible benefit. And then they need to make known that that has happened. A lot of times there's a lack of follow through that these initiatives that sales enablement has run have actually had an impact that you weren't just put on this treadmill to go running because sales enablement said so, but instead this actually correlated to your, you know, 120% attainment of goal, right? Yeah. So all of these pieces are critical. It just requires clear definition out of the gate, buy-in, right? And you get that buy-in when you're impactful. Yeah. Well, it, I think um, it's interesting because if you're in sales, it's like you either made your number or not. But in sales enablement, it's like you've got plausible deniability. You, know? you do. It's like, hey, man, yeah. you guys told me to do this. and, and it, I gave it to you. Yeah, I can't I mean, control I, what you do on the call. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think I think you, you got to have an attitude that that it's my my role has to be tied to the business objectives. Yeah. And I'm not just like a special special project person um, running around and responding to whatever the VP of sales wants. It, right. it has to be more strategic um, for good or bad. You know, if you make the number, then you celebrate. And if you don't, then yeah, you're in trouble too. You know, That's right. The sales enablement. Um, and then this I, is the, the last quick thing is um, the third example. It, it was funny, the product marketing uh, comes in and they've got this whiz bank <laughs> thing and it, it's kind of a meme you know that this group of like you know uh thick uh, coke bottle glasses and their buttons all the way up to the top that's right and, that's right they're they're um i just remember and, and again things might have changed over the years but i i just remember those meetings where you're just like what is this guy talking yeah, about why, why was this thing built what is this feature <laughs> yeah. for you're you're banking what percentage of our revenue on this yeah yeah i mean and 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 you know working with product marketing and sales is it's just like venus and mars kind of sometimes where where it's like really what what you that know should, that should be so our next how do book. you how do Products. you close that gap, um, you know, so that they actually can give something that that's useful and then you can coach to it. 
So we've got frameworks. I, I, yeah. I wouldn't put the onus on them to, to give you something that's useful. I think that the onus okay. is on sales and maybe sales enablement to do some kind of translation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I'll put it to you this way. I'm thinking of my, my, my wife is Persian. I remember when I, I, after she accepted my marriage proposal, I had to propose to her parents who are actually in Iran and I did not speak Farsi at the time. I do, I do now, right? So oh, we're doing wow. this thing and she can translate on the fly. She's an English professor. So <laughs> I'm saying these things and she's translating on the fly. She, I'm sure she did not translate verbatim what I said because it, it would have not been culturally appropriate necessarily. It was not, there, there are certain you know, uh, rules of engagement for lack of a better term. There's certain levels of respect and things that I'm supposed to be imparting. So she translated that on the fly. It was The onus was not on me <laughs> to articulate this to them, right? It's yeah. almost the same analogy. So when product comes with their domain of expertise, this is what we've done. We've listened to the customer. We built this thing. We've looked at the marketplace. We understand this is where it fits and this is what it's going to do. Well, sales has to do this. And of course, you know, closed loop has frameworks for this stuff. Sales mm -hmm. has to do this thing of being able to sift through that and say, okay, feature, benefit, understood. I don't go and sell features and benefits. What I do is I solve problems. So how do I take that and understand what problems someone would have to have today to care about this feature and benefit? So mm. I can actually use real language with a prospect as opposed to talking again about how we're swifter, faster, stronger, lighter, better, stronger, right? So that's mm. that's the key. And if you, if you instead of it, the expectation being that product's going to also understand how to talk to the, the prospect, if instead we say, great, they're going to do their job really well and we're going to do our job really well um, and, and, and we work together from that construct, you can have a more impactful, less... Um, less friction based or less confrontational relationship around the org. And then, you know, that ties mm. to marketing as well. You know, marketing, marketing's breadth is getting even more personal now, you know, with things like social and with other things that they might be doing and leveraging intent data that's on a one-to-one -one basis. And yet, and still, you know, their goal is, is higher level inspiration of thought leadership and helping folks to understand where they are on that, uh, that level of awareness, right? Whether or not they've got um, solution awareness, problem awareness, or, or company awareness, these sorts of things. That's kind of where their doctrine lies. So their messages are seldom as acute as a message would be when you're talking to your target ICP as an individual who's actually experiencing pain in their job to be done. So again, you leverage these same types of frameworks to be able to understand, well, marketing's got a job and we've got a job and the messages need to be aligned so that someone doesn't engage in marketing material and then have a conversation with Hillman and they're totally disparate and you know not not uh, uh, not speaking to the same issue um, but a lot of this stuff is done through the leverage of frameworks and and clear understanding of what everyone's role is yeah it's interesting and this is just a this is going to be the topic of our next podcast but how how <laughs> do you <laughs> you know nobody likes to admit that they have a problem you know, yeah. and, 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 and so, you know, that you're the, there's a lot of people in your target market that have a problem and, and, you know, for a fact that you, you could help solve it, um, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, <laughs> that's, yeah. you know, that's kind of step one, but how do you go about, you know, digging out um, if they've got a problem and they're willing to admit it to you, you know? Yeah, I think that just goes back to basic sales of understanding how to leverage social proof, right? And and being able to put people in a position where you're creating a safe space through rapport and, and rapport is not, you know, hey, how, how what's the weather in Austin? And oh, yeah, you moved from San Francisco. You're still a Giants fan. Like, you know, that's not rapport building. That's just banter, which is fine. It's part of the human connection. Right. But but don't don't believe that you're creating a trusted advisor relationship by by lurking through someone's LinkedIn and reflecting the things that you found. Right. But if you're leveraging things like scale is something that we teach in, in triangle selling, um, which which stands for status, certainty, autonomy, likeness and equity. If you're if you're maintaining these things in your conversations with folks and just from the status perspective, I understand if I asked David, who does not know me, a direct question about, hey, so are you struggling with top of funnel at 10 bound? He doesn't know me. And that's a threat. Why would David possibly say yeah, top of funnel is completely dried up over the course of the summer and we're going into this recession. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do come January. You're not going to tell, you're not going to share that with me because that's too vulnerable, right? But I could say to you, hey, David, you know, we're working with organizations similar to 10 Bound and folks who are in a CEO role who've had really strong sales and truly understand the sales profession. And what they found is that right now, the, because the economy has shifted, a lot of what they knew to be true before has dried up a little bit and the top of funnel doesn't look like it used to. 
I don't suppose any of this stuff is happening over at Tinbound right now, is it? Now, if you've got that problem, I'm not saying silver bullet, you're suddenly going to confess and, you know, lay on the operating table and say, you know, cut me open. Yes, of course, it's my problem. But I've reflected in a way where <laughs> I've given you some social proof that there might be some people who are just like you, who I'm working with, who are experiencing this problem. And here's your chance. If you want to mm -hmm. share with me that you're like some of these people, you know, then, then we can actually have an open conversation. And, and that's that's one technique for how you go about reflecting these things and being able to create a safe space for an honest and transparent relationship. I love that. And that's a good reminder. I have triangle selling. I can actually see it on my book. Ah. So I need to go back and, and, and uh, review <laughs> the scale framework because that's, Please do. that's money right there. And Hillman, it's funny. I, I mean, you've probably forgotten more interesting and helpful information than I've ever learned in my life. So um, the, I, I want to keep the conversation going. I know that we're going to be in Austin next week at the conference, the yes. Evolve um, Sales Development Conference, which is going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to it. And um, And then you must have a lot of other webinars and podcasts out there. What's the best way if people want to follow you and, and keep digging into your knowledge um, that they can uh, get in touch. Yeah, I'd love for folks to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. I, my email box is, I won't say it's the greatest hygiene, but I do get to it at least twice a week. <laughs> okay. And I'm, I'm happy to hop into a conversation. I'm happy to chat with folks about either Coach CRM or Closed Loop or any of those things that, that you, like you said, I may have forgotten <laughs> that, that I dust off. And then, you know, right now, if anybody's interested, if, if the Coach CRM uh, piece sounds interesting, um, hit coachcrm.com slash start now, and you can hop into a free trial there and check out the software, take it for a spin. We'd love to hear your feedback. And, um, you know, we, we're really committed to driving performance for teams. So we're heavy on providing professional services and getting folks up and running and helping them uh, support their coaching function. We just think it's a critical need in the organization that has such a win-win, win-win-win all the way around. So yeah, happy to do that as well. That's amazing. Okay, I'm signing up for Start Now. And awesome. and you you mentioned something that that's, people should think about is that, Professional services is really hard and not a lot of software companies even have a professional services arm. So they yeah. they 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 sell you the software and hey, good good luck with that. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. And so having closed loop as your arm, you know, to help implement it and really activate it is an amazing advantage. So we think so. We our, our yeah. clients have really benefited from it. We enjoy doing it and it's it's uh in lockstep with our full compendium of knowledge. So okay. we do what we can. Amazing. Okay. Hillman, thank you for coming on um, and uh, being a part of the uh, sales development podcast. And we'll see you over at Coach CRM. I can't wait to come to the conference. Thanks for having me, David. It's